Hey people, welcome to Accidental Gods, to the podcast where we believe that another world is still possible and that together we can make it happen. I'm Amanda Scott, your host at this place on the web where art meets activism, politics meets philosophy, and science meets spirituality, all in the service of conscious evolution and increasingly in the service of finding a way through to a flourishing, regenerative, beautiful, confident, safe and inspiring future that we would be proud to leave to the generations that follow us. My guest this week is a regenerative farmer. We've approached regenerative agriculture from a number of different angles in the last few months because in the pillars of what is going to hold us as we move through towards a future that works, how we feed ourselves, how we engage with the land, how we become part of the land, seems to me one of the absolute keystones to what we do. So we've spoken to Caroline Grindod, who talked us through some of the concepts of regenerative farming, and then to Ben Raskins, who's an agroforestry expert, looking at how trees are an integral part of how we need to be farming in the future. Then we talked with Liberty Nimmo about how she's converting two and a half acres of open field into a local community-supported agriculture project feeding her local community. And now we're going to talk to Lynn Castles, who, with her partner, Sandra, bought a 150-acre croft in the Cairngorms of Scotland, And for those of you who don't know that, it's a very mountainous, not incredibly hospitable area with quite a short growing season, very long days in the summer, very long nights in the winter. Lynn and Sandra met while they were working as rangers for the National Trust, as you'll hear, discovered a shared love for each other and for the land and the freedom that owning your own land and being able to grow your own food gives us. And they bought this croft in 2016 and have gone on to become the best crofting newcomers in 2018, an award that's given in Scotland. They were given the Food and Farming Award by the RSPB, Nature of Scotland's Awards, and they were nominated Nature Champions of the Decade as part of the RSPB's Nature of Scotland's Awards 10th anniversary. They featured in a television series called This Farming Life, and they've written a book together. Our Wild Farming Life, Adventures on a Scottish Highland Croft, which I thoroughly recommend as a beautiful, inspiring read for you or anyone you know who really wants to get to grips with how real newcomers can get into creating a regenerative, connected relationship with the land and the food that they bring from it. So people of the podcast... Please welcome Lynn Castles from Lynnbreck Croft in the Cairngorms of Scotland. So Lynn of Lynnbreck Croft, way up in the Highlands of Scotland, welcome to the Accidental Gods podcast. How is it up there with you? Because we've had no rain for, for months now. Are you in a drought also? We are indeed. I mean, I look outside today and it's this glorious sunny day, you know, bright blue skies, huge mountains, you know, long kind of expanse of forest in between us and the hills. But I would say since maybe May, we've had very, very, very little rain. It's it's an unknown fact that many people don't know is that the east of Scotland can actually be very, very dry. Yeah. We're experiencing that this year, definitely. Okay, and we'll talk maybe later about what you spoke about in the book of of what you do when you've got no water. Um, Because, yeah, you're in the shadow of the Cairngorms. Does that mean the midges are less? I promised Faith that I wouldn't talk about midges endlessly, but, you know, it's Scotland. What else do you talk about? Are the midges less than they would be otherwise? Uh, Sorry, midges? What are are midges? I don't know. (laughs) No, I don't don't know what those are. Sorry. (laughs) You just sealed my move north. Thank you're you, Lynn. Welcome. Right, you're my friend forever. That's that's it sorted. All right, so I came to hear of you because of your book, Our Wild Farming Life, uh, which, which is a delight. And as a writer, I am really genuinely in awe of the fluency with which it's written and, and the voice that you manage to find and the lightness of touch and the ease with which you bring in quite complex regenerative farming concepts 
in an unfolding narrative of you exploring your life from being not a farmer to being a farmer. And just as a writer, I'm wondering, had you written a lot of other things before or was this your first writing experience? And if so, how did that come about? Well, First of all, thank you very much for your your kind words about about the book. Uh, that that really does mean a lot, and I'm I'm really kind of grateful that you've shared that with me. Um, it is indeed the first uh, ever writing experience. So so how it, how it worked uh, was that we we wrote we're, we're kind of shared authors on it. So myself and my partner Sandra, who who live and work here at Lundbrek, uh, we're, we're shared authors on it. But ha- how we split it was that I would do the writing and then Sandra would edit it. So I would write, she would edit, I would write, she would edit. So if there was anything that she felt I hadn't explained particularly well or elements that I'd missed out, you know, or even down to very simple kind of grammatical errors. She would edit and then we would kind of create it from that kind of way. But, you know, honestly, Amanda, before that, the only experience of writing I'd ever really had was at university, uh, writing essays, um, which is a completely, as I then discovered, completely different way of doing things. So so that's kind of how, how it evolved uh, to, to where it's at now. So, so I'm delighted that you've enjoyed it. Yeah, totally. And English is not Sandra's first language, am I right? It sort of is and it isn't. So Sandra's from Switzerland. So Sandra grew up uh, in Zurich, so German speaking part of Switzerland, but her mum is from Scotland. So when they right. were at home, they spoke English. When out, out, outside of that, they spoke German. Right. For the people who listen, who are interested in non-fiction writing, because we're, we're running the Thrutopia Masterclass and, and about half of the people there are non-fiction writers, I would like to delve a little bit before we head off into the farming and the the experience of building a farm from scratch, basically, in not terribly hospitable land. How you came about to be writing the book? Was it that they the publishers saw your television program and approached you as a result of that, or did you go to them? So we were uh, very lucky in that the publishers came to us. So it was about May. 2020 of of uh, peak lockdown and we had an email through from from Chelsea Green who are the the publishers who we've ended up going with and they were actually a publishing company that we knew because they published lots of book on things like regenerative living regenerative farming you know composting fermenting foraging all the kind of stuff that we love so we kind of thought it was a bit of a joke to begin with you know it's just a, a cheeky spam email that's come in but we followed it up and it turns out that it was legit um and I think it's probably because of the television programme that we did, uh, This Farming Life, back in 2019, that they saw. But I think what we liked about that film, or that that filming, was that it did show us in a, yes, we're new, we're young, starting up a farm. But we always tried to weave in elements of, but we like this idea of regenerative farming, so we're going to try and move it down that path. So I think maybe that's why Chelsea Green saw it and thought, these guys would, would kind of match with our vision and what it is that we do. So their story, I think, would appeal to a wider audience. Yes, yes. And clearly that's how I found you was in the Chelsea Green catalogue. And and apart from the fact they've got a glorious picture of you and Sandra on the front with a really magical looking Highland cow that I guess is Ronnie. Is that Ronnie on the front? Because Ronnie, Ronnie's, Ronnie's a girl and Ronnie's very very, very, very dark brown with a beautiful kind of highlights on her fringe. She's just gorgeous. So it's a really beautiful picture and it's Thank you. it's Scotland and it's crofting and it's regenerative and it fits everything. Mm-hmm. You're writing, Sandra's editing. How long did the writing process take? Because genuinely, I wouldn't say this if I didn't mean it, it's a very fluent book and it it has a very light touch and, and feels very human and very honest. Well, again, that, yeah, it's really kind of you to say that, and that, that I think that's exactly what we wanted in the end to to produce. You know, the the the, the first contact, as I said, was made about May 2022. I think we got the contract sort of signed, sealed and delivered by about October 2020, sorry, 20, uh, May 2020 and then October 2020. Then the first kind of, I guess, deadline that we were aiming for was the end of March. So That's really tight. we had six months. Yeah. In between that six months, we had uh, two Highland cows that had just gone to the abattoir. So we had all the beef to process and sell. Every month we were getting out meat clubs. We were in the butchery processing that. Every week we were sorting and delivering eggs and then we had all the farm chores so we had such a tight window I now look at it and I just think I can't believe this and this is a 200 page book 212 pages 
So which of it's 400 words per page? I'll do that. That's about 80,000 words. That's that's a big word count in six months you hadn't written before. The, well, this this is it. Isn't, isn't naivety a wonderful thing? Doesn't it? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Nobody tells you you can't do this, so you just get hell and do it. Wow. But, you know, I, I think I kind of love that. You know, I love that we just went for it. And so basically what I used to do was I'd, I'd get up I'd get up at five o'clock every morning. So I'm a morning person. So I would get up at five and then I would maybe be writing till about nine. And then the following evening, Sandra would edit and so and so on and so forth until we submitted the first draft, which was the first official draft. I think for us, it was about draft kind of 12 or 13. Of course. Yes. Drafting. Drafting is a thing that you do. Yes. But you count drafts as when you hand in, otherwise you go crazy. Okay, so draft, official draft number one. And, um, you know, a few weeks later, we had a Zoom uh, chat with the editor and and uh, it, it was a pretty t- kind of, she, she was incredible. So the editor of Chelsea Green, who was absolutely wonderful, but it was quite toe curling for us because in effect, the, you know, the first draft was rejected. Um, and being without any experience in writing and not really knowing any authors, that was a, such a big shock for us because right. we didn't realise that that's, you know, par for the course. That's just what happens. So um, we we were then kind of said, well, look, uh, here's some guidance. This is the areas that I think you should improve on. Uh, she then also went off and, you know, marked up a few chapters and said, you know, this is what I like. This is what I don't like. I want more of this. Real line editing of the chapters. A real line editing, wow. which was just exceptional. Yeah. Um, so I then went and spat my dummy out for about a month <laughs> and thought, <laughs> maybe shed the odd tear as well. And then there was one day in May, actually, uh, of last year, so May of 2021, and it was a nice day. And I went and sat in our polytunnel with my laptop and I thought, I'm going to give this a go. And actually, Amanda, it was incredible because the, the main advice for, the, for by the editor was, you know, be more honest, you know, have have fun with the book, which I didn't really know exactly how to do that at that point. Um, and, and I also took to, to, to heart another piece of advice that a friend had given me, which was basically, who basically said, write how you speak. And so I took all those three elements together. I went into the polytunnel. It was so cozy and warm. It was really bright. And I just went for it. And so basically from the first week in May to the middle of July, I rewrote about 80% of the book. But it was from the heart. It was from the, the mouth and the heart and less so much of the head. And I think that's maybe why you get more of the fluency and more of the honesty in it. Right. Right. And such good advice. Very good advice. But when I was a very baby writer, I went on a a writing, one of these go away and write for a week with a famous person. And it was Faye Weldon. And she said, find your voice. And that's, you know, that is write as you speak. In effect, don't try and write how you think sentences should be just constructed. Write in the way that the voice is going in your head. And that that really does come across. Yeah, thank and you. And yes, I think you're right. The naivety of anybody said it's perfectly normal for your first draft to be completely monstered <laughs> and destroyed. I, if it makes you feel any better, I, I once put an entire manuscript on the fire. I was so angry with my editor. Uh, but, my, but Faith is programmed to say, Selena is always right. And she's not my editor anymore, but much to my regret. And I used to go down and go, ah! Yeah. And, and that, you know, you don't know whether to, to, to scream or cry or beat your head off the wall or no it can't be because everyone hands in their first draft thinking this is it but actually my friends whose editors go yep okay and just pass it straight to the copy editor are the ones who are in tears because their writing never improves and their books are not nobody's first draft is perfect unless you're Lee Child yeah you know he writes his draft in six weeks hands it in and that's it wow. but he's Ben, and the, first of all, he's you know this is novel number eighty something, or, and he spent the whole of the year thinking about it, and doing all the editing in his head, and then he just has to sit down and write it, and that's fine because you had that much experience. But for the nor- normal mortals, it's it's just not like that. No, it doesn't, so it work. so thank you. It's really really honest. Are you planning another book? Just just having had the experience of one, is there another one sneaking out? That's a very juicy question. So we've had. Early conversations with the editor uh, and Chelsea Green, who would be keen for us to do a second book. At the minute, I don't know what that would look like. I don't know what it would be. You know, the first book, in yeah. some ways, dare I use the word easy, in that it's an obvious, easy choice to write a book about our story. Oh, yeah. I know the story. You know, nobody knows it better than me because because I'm like, so I just write it. Whereas the second book, um, where would that take us? What would it What would it look like? Yeah, so, so so I don't know. So it's and and I think as well, you know, we're still in recovery mode 
from having written the first one. Yes. It was a big undertaking. Um, and and on, on both sides, on the kind of the pre-writing and then the post-writing, you know, there's a lot that kind of goes on in that. So so I'd say we're at a probably in a quite a, a sort of a, a solid phase of digesting. Um ruminating yeah because it's like it's like the first album isn't it everybody says you know you get your first album you get on top of the pops I don't even know that still exists but when I was a youth it did and then everyone goes okay where's the second album and you think well I threw everything into this I have I don't have you know the tracks in my bottom drawer to bring out and exactly as you say you I'm guessing you've thrown out this it is very honest it's quite raw in places I'm there's a vulnerability to writing that everybody suddenly feels they know you and therefore they own a bit of you which can be, you know, holding the boundary of that can be quite shocking if no one's prepared you for it and nobody ever does because because how do you? And and then, yeah, what what is next? And perhaps you need to just do a bit of living before there's something else to write about or you take a different tack. So I, I have lots of ideas. We'll talk about that off air at some point. So let's have a look about what the book actually talks about and about your life because it is how did... Lynn and Sandra come to be farming 150 acres <laughs> of Cairngorm countryside that sounds to me as if it hadn't had a lot of input and the input that it had was not explicitly regenerative. So give us the, the very edited highlight, of first of all, of how you and Sandra met and then what the drive was to go away from what sounded like quite stable, quite fun, not office jobs, to to get some land and become stewards of the land? Well, you know, whenever I'm asked that question, I still can't help myself but, you know, laugh out loud a little bit that this all happened. You know, again, I hark back to the word of, the, the use of the word naivety. But, you know, in, in a sort of a summary, so Sandra and I met whilst working uh, for the National Trust. I was actually Sandra's boss. Um, she, got, she got the job completely out of her own merit. <laughs> um but, you know, within a few weeks of meeting, and we talk about this in the book, within a few weeks of meeting, we basically discovered that we had this kind of shared passion, obviously for nature, because we were working outdoors as rangers for the National Trust. But we also had this kind of real sort of strong desire to live much closer to the land, you know, connect with it in a way which is much more kind of physical, emotional, spiritual all of the above. Um, and the way that we envisioned us doing that um, back on that kind of dark September evening was to basically buy a bit of land and to grow our own food and to just really make enough money that would cover the bills. That was always the focus. So after meeting and then working in the south, so we were down in the southeast of England, so we were just outside Maidenhead. I always say it was it's it's the that kind of beautiful triangle of Maidenhead, Windsor and Slough, and we were kind of right in the middle of it. <laughs> and wow. Uh, you know, we, we loved what we did, but it wasn't for us long term. But we did have, you know, good jobs with a good employer, with with good prospects. Um, but our desire was so strong that we thought, you know what, you, you get one shot at life. Um, let's move north. Let's go to Scotland. And the reason for moving to Scotland was that um, Sandra's half Scottish. So she felt like that was kind of her home. Right. And also, you know, quite honestly, land is just more affordable in Scotland. And, and we didn't have yeah. a lot of money. Yeah, it's that or West Wales, basically. Exactly. You know, yeah. we didn't have really an option. So we, we moved to Scotland, spent two years working as tree planters uh, in the Scottish borders. You know, so we were planting trees right up to high elevations of about 750 metres. Big rewilding native wow. tree planting. Um, absolutely loved it. I've never been so fit and skinny and muscly in my entire life. I could literally eat anything all the time. And I was, you know, I was like Cindy Crawford. It was incredible. Um, but, you know, the whole point of being in the borders was that we would then have a place to then look at other places at the weekend. So we started looking on the open market and we started looking on the 1st of January 2015, looking for about five acres, uh, as I've described, you know, grow food, a few chickens. Just enough to live off. Yep. Just enough, Amanda, just enough. Long story short, Sandra develops this affair while I'm, you know, looking for places with this place called Limbrek. Uh, she's looking at it, dreaming about it, yearning for it. It's way over our budget and it's 150 acres. So it's 30 times the size of what we're looking for. <laughs> yeah. We've been looking for a while, didn't find anything. Happened to be one day driving past Limbrek, arranged a viewing 
the end of the story. Right. And so what we document a lot in the story in the book from that point is how we then kind of moved heaven and earth to buy it, you know, taking on a loan, yeah. any single pot of money that we had. So really, you know, doing what I describe as everything that your parents tell you not to do. Yeah. Yeah, get into debt, take on too much, all of those things. Exactly. Uh, But I I just, I can't really explain it any other way than just the desire was so strong. And I think the other thing, Manda, was that we just simply never believed that it wouldn't happen and we never believed that it would work. We didn't have a plan B because we didn't believe that plan A was going to fail. So we were so focused in our our view. And then we we arrive at Limbrek, uh, 18th of March, 2016. Everything's brown. Everything is brown. The landscape is brown, just just brown everywhere. Bracken brown or mud brown or both or grey? Grass brown, bracken brown, you know, house brown, doors brown, everything's brown. And just really a, one of those kind of oppressive days when the clouds, you know, sits just over the hilltops. And obviously Limbrek at that point was what I describe as basically being semi-derelict. There was there was no agricultural infrastructure, you know, apart from a, a kind of a 20-year-old fence that went around the, the edge of the croft. The croft hadn't been worked um, agriculturally for about 30 years. Uh, there was two old stone buildings, both of which were derelict. And then there was one wooden cabin, which is where we live today, which had been built about uh, sort of the end of the the, the kind of 1990s. And, and that was it. Um, so so we found ourselves in a place, no, no infrastructure, no background in farming and no money. And the whole journey evolved from there um, into building up a business, basically, that stayed true to what it was that we always wanted to do, which was grow our own food and, you know, really quality of life focus uh, and really kind of spiritual connection focus, but do it in a way where we were always enhancing the land that we took became stewards of. So de- developing a farm business that were whereby the animals would be part of a team. And in addition to to providing meat, which obviously some of them do, their goal is their their wool is so much bigger than that. It's about you know the 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 the, the, the animal manure enriching the soil. It's it's about the kind of really in, enhancing the symbiotic relationships that these their, their kind of wild for, forebearers would have had, and really then building up Limbrek from that point. Beautiful. So much in that. I've written down four words in capitals on my pad. The first one is freedom then rewilding, then intent, and then spirit. So I want to unpick a little bit of those, and then then I really want to look at the actual nuts and bolts of what you've done. But it seems to me what you were seeking to begin with was, was freedom. And whatever we look forward, whenever we do the spiritual work of how does humanity look if we get it right, everyone almost without exception. So let's say 99% come to a sense of personal freedom and safety. And and that freedom and safety coexist. If you're safe, you're free. If you're free, you're safe. They're they're almost synonymous. And that you are endeavouring to structure that within the boundary of a predatory capitalist system that, that still exists and that you needed to do that. You needed shelter, land, water, and and power. Those are the real the four pillars of of the freedom that we can get here. And that what what got you there was a really clear intent and and we're building intent structures and other things in our group of how well, how does a intent feel? What it felt to you was there was no plan B. Once you had got there, you knew this was the place. And then that takes us to the spirit. And I'd really like to drill a little bit down into the You've you've mentioned a spiritual connection to the land a couple of times. Can you can you just say a little bit more about that? Because this is a spiritual podcast as much as anything else. Of how you, Lynn, experience connection to the spirit of Lynn Brack. Yeah, I think it's a really good good question, Manda. And I think it's I think it's probably a question that I can't completely answer. I can just share the journey to this point. Thank you. I think one of the things that we struggled with whenever. We were in our old lives, you know, even when we were working for the National Trust and, you know, we were living in a, you know, a lovely place, but it was very, very busy. We just felt that we both struggled to, um, with with a lot of things. We could never really find our place. Um, we, we just didn't feel like we were of this world in that we weren't of a world that was, 
you know, sort of very busy, very mechanised, and I kind of mean artificially mechanised, that we weren't really connecting with the food that we ate. We started to question, you know, where our food came from, what impact that was having on our physical and mental health. All these sort of things were really kind of what drove us to this point. And I think since we've moved to Limbrek, it's all about really kind of, kind of developing a, a two-step into a full dance routine. You know, we've been really getting to know the land. We've been really starting to, you know, what I talk about, consuming the land. And I mean, and, you know, can, can, the word consumption can, can, you know, can be really, can be a really kind of horrible, aggressive word. But I mean it in the most loving and softest and gentlest sense in that the, the, the land that we consume literally feeds us physically, mentally, spiritually. Mm. Um, it is an absolute privilege to eat you know the meat that we produce to eat the food that we produce i can't think of a way to more tangibly connect more strongly with the land than to literally eat it and drink it and then in addition to that i would add breathe it smell it touch it so probably a lot of really tangible tangible elements there to the spiritual side but i would then start to kind of say that that then journey has then in transition, grown alongside how I would say Limbrek is shaping our lives in a different way in that we're starting to naturally live more seasonally. So our summer days are long. We're outside with, with no midges. You know, we're just getting on with the work. We're enjoying the days. And Manda, it is full on. You know, by the end of the summer, yeah, we are shattered but what it means is that we've had that really beautiful experience of being outside in the sun, filling ourselves up with vitamin D, you know, filling our lungs full of this clean highland air. And we're just staying physically active. And that in itself is meaning that we're exposed to this beautiful landscape. We're engaging with the, the animals and insects that we share. So we're building that connection. So again, it is really building quite a tangible connection with, you know, Mother Nature, with Gaia. And then, you know, you're you're sort of, you know, in, in addition to that, you're really I, I guess, really embracing every season so much more. So I love winter. I, I absolutely love winter. And I, I find it so, you know, I find it so sad that we've we've now in, in a society, so many people struggle with winter. You know, they struggle with seasonal affective disorder. They struggle with the lack of light, the lack of vitamin D. And that darkness, which is a real association of of loneliness and, and long stretches of not being able to do anything. Whereas I think here in our transition to the life at Limbrek is, uh, you know, I can quite happily sleep for 12 hours in the winter time. You know, I'm, I'm mm. quite happy to go to bed at eight o'clock and get up at eight o'clock the next morning and my body needs it. So I feel like I'm in much more in sync with everything else that's going on in the world, everything else that's hibernating and lying low we're doing the same and then come to the summer. So so I think there's a number of different different ways. And then I think finally, you know, we've kind of, you know, I'm talking about physically eating, physically consuming and then physically experiencing. I think, I think then as we've experienced all of that, what we're starting to experience in our head is kind of the next stage. So just really getting more confidence in, you know, what it is that we believe in spiritually, what really enriches us individually. And probably, you know, if you speak to Sandra and I, probably both would be quite different. But I feel like that has been a beautiful experience because it's really helped us to get more and more, not just feel more and more connected with the place, but just happier you know, for want of a, a word that's maybe overused, I don't know that it is, but some people might say that it is, but just a life whereby you feel like every day you're just getting a little bit closer to to that real feeling of joy, you know, to that real feeling of happiness and to just feeling more resilient, to be able to cope with and more buffer all the other stuff, not disconnect, but just kind of mute <laughs> or turn the sound down a little bit and yet still live the way that we're living now in a way that I would say, is still of relevance to somebody in the centre of London. Yes. Yes. Say, unpack that last bit a bit more. How is the way that you're living now of relevance to somebody in the centre of any big city, Glasgow, Edinburgh, London, New York? How would you help someone who is locked in a bustle of electric lights and concrete and tarmac and sound? How would you help them to connect with what you've found, the freedom and the spiritual connection that you found at Lindbrack? I think the only way that I can really sort of summarise it is, is really understanding 
honestly um being true to being true to ourselves being true to being true to myself you know really asking those kind of existential questions of 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 who I am who am I not in a kind of a big airy fairy I have no idea who I am but more in a just a you know what 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 do I believe in? What do I enjoy? What really what do I get joy out of? What 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 are all of those elements? Yeah. And then to kind of pick through them in a way where you have to be brutally honest and you have to say, I like that idea, but you know what? That's just not me. And then to start to make incremental changes in your life to try and get to what is you. So I think that applies to all of us, no matter where we are. And it's not to say that I think that our way is the right way for everybody. I don't believe that everybody is yearning for this way of life. But what I do believe is that what we've done and what we've tried to do and what we're still trying to do so much is to just really stay true and constantly connect back in and not be afraid to do that. And that's the hardest bit. You know, we live in a world where fear is everywhere. It's so all-encompassing. Yeah. And it's just about trying to unpick that fear. And and I, you know, I love how you broke it down, Manda, about the, the securities of, hey, do you know what? I've got a roof over my head. Wow. I am so lucky. Yeah. Hey, I've got I've got water coming out of the tap. Oh my goodness. I'm so lucky. I have food in my fridge. And these these little and they're sort of described as little things. Manda, if we didn't have them, we wouldn't be alive. There's a lot of other things that we can live without we can't live without these things. So, wow, how lucky are we? Yes. And there have been times from the sound of things when when those edges were, were much less secure, when we do live still in in a different economic system and you do have insurance to pay and, and debts to pay off and you still have to somehow generate capital and, and money. And and where that sense of security and joy sounded a lot more fragile. Talk us a little bit through the the beginning part. So you arrived at a brown, brown land, brown house, into a cabin. You are off grid for water, but on grid for power, I think. And then you realize quite soon you're still both working other jobs outside because you have to bring money in. That transition to being self sufficient financially as well as self sufficient in your own primary needs sounded quite rocky at times. Talk us through the the early stages of how you began to make money that was by selling stuff from the farm outside. Yeah, I, I really I'm really glad that you've touched on this topic because I think it's kind of really quite quite a pertinent one because it was quite a fundamental shift that we had to make in terms of not just, you know, practically our income, but in terms of a shift in what is secure in life and you know what does that look like and so for the first four years we both worked uh, off farm so I worked four days a week and then down to two days a week and then Sandra was self-employed uh, so we launched ourselves kind of full time here on the 1st of uh, January 2020 ironically the year the pandemic breaks out that was really just as, <laughs> was really yeah. quite unfortunate you know had this secure income and then oh what happened there but anyway yeah, and not even any no, furlough anymore because you no weren't furlough, employed. No so. furlough, nothing. Ah. Uh, yeah, can I have my job back? No. So we, we decided to make that leap because we, we'd started off selling eggs and then it was eggs and pork and then it was eggs, pork and beef. And then we installed a small micro butchery on the croft, which meant that we could go into added value range because one of the things that you know here we, we don't make we don't have tons of animals here we only carry the amount of animals that we believe have a regenerative impact on the land and us so therefore the number that we carry isn't huge so our challenge uh, is to add value is to maximize value to use every element of the animal and to just really just make it exceptional produce so by installing a micro butchery it meant that we could then you know diversify into an artisan range of you know particularly meats so put the micro butchery in uh, then obviously go full time uh, from the from the first of of, of of January 2020 it, it was a really big leap because obviously yes the pandemic that made that meant things we know that we a lot of what we'd planned to do now couldn't happen. But what we always tried to do was first of first of all, with the income that we were going to plan to get in would be diversified. So so most, you know, a lot of farms nowadays there'll be, you know, a beef farm or a sheep farm or a, you know, a cereal grower. We always Loved the idea that nature is obviously diverse. There's so much, you know, you know, nature's not a three-legged stool. She's a million-legged stool. She's got so much happening. So that if one of those legs or two of those legs come out, 
she's okay. So we wanted to design a business that was similar. So we wanted to do eggs, pork, beef, you know, artisan. We'd do tours, we'd do courses, you know, we'd, we'd, we'd have a rental. We'd, do, we'd have this really diversified income stream. And they would all be, you know, in terms of financial value, they would all be of different, say, profit margins, but they would all be inherently connected, okay? So they all kind of rely on each other. And they're all around this core element of of, of you know, food production in a way which is really in harmony with the environment in, in a business model that is really in harmony with farming with nature because it's, you know, that, that's the kind of way of doing it. Right. So so that's why we, tr- that's how we tried to, to build it up. And that's the kind of model that we follow today. That is the model that we follow today. What was difficult um, was one, managing the workload element because you haven't just got chickens, you've got mm. chickens, you've got pigs, you've got cows, you know, you've got bees, you've got courses, you've got tours. You're running around all over the croft because, you know, our animals are never static. The hens are always on the move. The cows are always on the move, you know. So so, so, so that's the first element that's hard to manage um, was, was our own kind of expectations on our own workload. And then the second element was, and probably for me, less so Sandra, for me still is that transition out of the, you know the kind of the security of the monthly salary the full-time job you know that the having lump sum here so that that's my security uh so that's been a real mindset shift to kind of seeing it as part of our security so the financial element is part of our security but you know let's say for example at this time of the year we you know our kitchen garden is just producing like crazy you know it's like niagara falls for produce out there and if we don't get under there and catch some of that water with our bucket then we're not going to eat very well in the winter so that's actually security to harvest that you know at the minute we were talking about the well you know we have a well we have a private well here and we're in the middle of a drought if we don't reduce our water you know if we don't have like a shower less a week or if we don't you know really start to be careful about our water usage we have no water that's not very secure so we need to make sure that we're spending time making sure all the water butts are working you know making sh- all those sorts of things um harvesting our firewood we're totally reliant on firewood for our heating. Uh, so we don't use electric or gas or oil for any of that. So we have to put in a few hours in the summer, a good few hours in the summer to process all of that. That means that for the winter, we're warm and cosy. That's security. You know, it's all these different elements. Whereas if I just focused on the money element, I could maybe buy the firewood, I could buy the food, I could buy the water. But actually, if I can do all of those things myself then I don't have the financial pressure and the financial security is somewhat lessened. It's still factors, but it's not everything. Yes. Beautiful. Because you can have a shower less a week, but your animals still need to drink and the hotter it is, the more they need to drink. So there's a limit to how much you can reduce your water use. Have you expanded water collection? Because it seems to me as we move towards climate breakdown, the capacity to save water when it falls is becoming increasingly important are you heading for that yeah definitely it, it's a bit of a it's a bit of a kind of an obsession so over the last few years um we're now harvesting just off the top of my head we're harvesting off roofs um capacity for about 8000 liters of water that we can harvest so we've got wow. one big water butt right. of about five and a half thousand liters and then we have another two kind of thousand litre containers and then some smaller ones so so that's a big focus on that is for the kitchen garden because we have you know we produce 95 percent of our vegetables from the kitchen garden our year round so we need to keep that watered we then have uh we've got two wells on site one which is for us and then we installed a second one over a spring we got you know a dowser in so we installed a second one over a spring for the cattle you know for the animals so again so we're not just everybody's drawing on one we're dissipating the use and then the longer term plan from that, which we've started to do, is install ponds around Limbrec. Right. So we installed a couple of ponds just a couple of years ago. Going forward, you know, I, I want to do that more. You know, we have one lower field, which is very wet. Uh, if we could get a, a digger in, start excavating ponds. You know, the whole idea is that when it does rain, we have to keep as much of that on the croft now and part of that can be mm. above ground storage it can be water butts it can be ponds but actually a big 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 factor is underground storage in the soil so that's when the whole element of healthy soils with deep rooted plants with 
tall grasses and trees that will intercept and slow the flow of the water down to then drip into the soil and then the soil holds that. That's the biggest, you know, bank of water that we really have to invest in. Yes, because you're, I'm imagining, and I may be wrong, that you're on quite steep slopes. You're on the sides of the Cairngorms, so it's not flat land. So as the water comes down, talk us a little bit through that, because you talk in the book about sequestering carbon, about having sequestered 12 times more carbon than you give off, and and that you said you don't want to have more animals on the land than can help it regenerate. How are you designing and assessing that, and what changes are you making as you get data back in? So if, if I'm honest with you, I would say a lot of it is just visual. Okay. The only real um, you know, scientific survey that we had done here was right at the start, and we got a, a, a botanist in to do a, an ecological survey of all the plants that we have here. So she did plants and lichens. So the plan is, is maybe in another few years' time, is to have that survey redone. And then we'll see, you know, we know that there's more different plants, but, you know, she, she can sort of confirm that with the, the sort of scientific eye. Um, from that point on, it is quite quite simply observational. So we can see, you know, we can see visually areas where the cattle have made an impact. You start to get to know when they've maybe grazed an area a little bit too hard, or they've maybe been in there a little bit too long than when they've not. What do you see? What's the what? What do you? Assess. Well, I guess you assess things like um, the impact on the ground, the height of the grasses, the amount of dunging. It's just really kind of getting an understanding of, of the impact that they've had and then using our experience as to how long that ground or those plants will recover within a certain amount of time within the conditions we're currently experiencing. There's so many variables to this. And this is when, you know, I, I really think that, you know, modern day farmers, you know, get a lot of, they get a lot of negative press, you know, in, in the kind of the situation that we're in today. And, and there's all sorts of reasons, you know, why farming is the way it is today. But farmers do carry so much experience and knowledge of things that we just never really, we just take for granted. So so there's a lot of that kind of yeah, observational yeah. element. And then it's things like digging a pit in the field and counting the number of worms. You know, I always think that's one of the most powerful ways to assess whether or not the change that you're looking to have, if it is a neurogenerative capacity to, to build soil, to build organic matter, to not compact your soil is really the best way because worms will tell you everything. And if you've got a soil plum full of worms and we're starting to see areas where, you know, year on year we're thinking, oh, there's more, there's more worms. And then year on year we're thinking, then right. year on year we're seeing, oh, there's more beetles. And then, oh, there's more birds. And all of a sudden that kind of trophic level just starts to go and it changes every year. Brilliant. And I'm guessing also different species. You talk a little bit in the book about pigs going through and then thistles <laughs> coming in because they, they're they there to put their big deep tap roots down through soil that's been compacted. And once they've done that, I guess, I hope, I'm asking this specifically because we have a field that is currently a kind of thistle meadow. <laughs> if we let it regenerate, other species will begin to outcompete because they're they're the the kind of pioneer species in a successional event did you find that with you with your thistles that as you as you carried on just grazing things over them that other plant species came through yeah I mean what what we started to notice was that you do get this kind of period of succession so the only um, so in some of the areas where we ran some of the pigs which were in quite small paddocks we had thistle jungles you know they, they were literally it was like there's just thistles here <laughs> so right. one of the things and pigs don't really like thistles. well do you know pigs will eat thistles um this oh, was a okay. post-pig ah. thing. Yeah, no, pigs, pigs, pigs actually really enjoy eating thistles. Oh, okay. So this was a post, yeah, <laughs> this was a post-pig thing. So one of the things for the first couple of years, we did actually do some direct intervention in whereby we, kind of what you would do in, in a forest, we thinned out the thistles. So we would go through what's what I call a thistle spudder. Some people would call it a, um, I think there's other names for it, but it's just basically a kind of a, a metal stick with a prong on the bottom and you just lever the thistles out. So we th- right. we started to thin out some of the thistles just to to allow some of the by other... By hand? Yeah, just by hand. Yeah, yeah. Wow. yeah. So if you've got a big area, I'm not sure that would be entirely, entirely doable. Yeah. But then do you know what? A lot of this comes down to what it is that your expectations are and how much time you're willing to give it. Because eventually... Nature will do it for you, absolutely. Whereas this was an area where we were wanting more diversity for the cattle to graze. So it was about finding that balance. So, and, you know, funny, depending on the thistle, the cattle will sometimes eat thistle. You know, we'll watch our cattle eating marsh thistle. They'll go around and eat the tops of them. You know, as I say, pigs will eat thistles 
if you put them through areas. So it's all about, this is when I always say, it's not about us managing the land. I, I really do not like the, the terminology of, of, of land management. I don't believe we manage the land. I think it's in some ways, dare I say it, it's a little bit of kind of human arrogance to think that we can. Of course it is. Yes. But I think what we do need to do is manage ourselves and it's about managing our expectations. Right. So what do we want to achieve? What's the land doing? And then how can we manage, you know, our team of animals accordingly and our actions to achieve the outcome that is going to deliver collective good? Brilliant. So two questions arising from that. The first one is what happened when you when you selectively took up some of the thistles? What else came in their place? Did it work? Yeah. So when we when after we'd moved the pigs out of an area, because the, the, the area was all kind of churned up. So it was all kind of quite, you know, kind of exposed earth, which nature hates. It's kind of like us getting a graze and then a scab forming. You know, part of the scab was lots of thistles. Um, but when the when the kind of the area was cleared, we threw we scattered down wildflower seed. So what we were wanting to do was two things, really. One, allow any dormant seeds in the seed bank to have an opportunity. This is your chance to grow. Uh, and then two, add some diversity when the ground has kind of perf been perfectly prepared for it. So in areas where, say, we would have had one or two dominant grasses, in addition to the thistles coming in and then kind of moving on, we're now having things like, you know, different grasses. We're getting wildflowers, things like red clovers, white clovers, uh, plantain, you know, just so much more right. diversity in right. there. Yeah. Uh, so you're now walking through it. And not, not only is it... Um, not only is it more diversity, but it's much more dense. So, so, so a lot of our fields, you know, we're on very acidic soil, so mosses grow here very well. But another reason why we had so much moss uh, in the in the in the sort of the fields was really a lack of a lack of grazing. You know, it had kind of been grazed, and then it, there was a lack of grazing. So, in addition to all the other intervention that we'd taken. This then disturbed the moss so that it meant that, you know, we didn't just have an area where you'd maybe have five blades of grass, you maybe had 20 blades, but it wasn't just one grass, it was grasses and wildflowers. Yes. So, so it's really kind of transitioning it that kind of way. Brilliant. And I remember a friend going on a farm tour, this is in England in Gloucestershire, but they had moved to a pasture fed model and the guy was six foot tall and he said, you know, the grasses get up to my head height, but as well as going up, they were creating sideways mats, yep. really thick mats. So the cattle then didn't poach the land because they never got through even when it was raining. And they took, uh, my friend went in January, I think, and it was like minus 10 or something. It was it was definite minus numbers. And they measured the temperature at the surface of the grass. And then they put the thermometer down under this thick mat and it was plus three. It just never froze. Yeah. So, so then you can have your water, if you need to have water pipes and things that are not freezing. It just, it's a completely different way of approaching. Yep. And I'm interested, you talk about your animal team and about us stewarding land rather than managing it. And I wonder to what extent there's a, a conversation going on between you and the animals about when they need to be moved and, and what they need from you as well as what you need from them. Yeah, I think I think that's a really good question, sort of Amanda, to, to look at. And I think that um, one of the mottos that we talk about here is is working with the animalness of the animal. It's a phrase that we've pinched from a, a regenerative farmer called Joel Salatin in America, who's a, who's been a real you know he's a real kind of power powerhouse, and, and we really like him. We've taken a lot from his teachings, um, and I think working with the animalness of the animal, you know, in essence, is working with everything that it needs and requires, and that is not just you know physical. It's not just food. It's not just uh, shade. It's not just shelter. It's also all the kind of the mental health elements too uh, you know uh, so you know are they are they entertained are they busy are they stimulated you know are they content right. in their heads so they content yes. so I think it's for us it's been a journey about learning what all of that looks like um, and that's an area that really Sandra has excelled there's a there's a an animal behavioralist in America called Temple Grandin very very famous you know she had a film made about her with Claire Danes incredible film and uh, she has autism and she's really kind kind of used her autism to tap into basically being able to read and understand, you know, kind of communicate to, to some extent, I guess, with animals. Sandra has a bit of that natural skill. She can very much read them, understand them and work with them. In addition to then getting to understand that their impact on the land. And 
I think that one of the, 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 the key things, the key elements to all of this is time. It's actually just taking the time and relearning how to learn with our eyes and our ears rather than rushing and just reading. And I think that's a big thing that we've really transitioned into doing so that you know, like everybody, we can we can we can fall victim to. I'm too busy. I've got to run here, and then I've got to feed these pigs, and then I've got to move these cows, and then I've got to sort these chickens. Actually, what you really need to do, I would say, to be really successful at this, you know, you've got to do an element of that. It's it's life at the end of the day. But actually, it's to to really slow down and to really engage and understand your animals. You know, one of the examples that I always give is that a lot of people will say pigs are a nightmare to keep. Pigs are a nightmare to keep because they're always escaping and blah, blah, blah. Lovely, you know, like dogs, but nightmare, always escaping. And I always touch wood when I say this, but we've never had pigs escape, as in they've never tried to ram the fence. And I always believe that it's because they've no need to, because they're just so busy. Right. They're so entertained. They're, they've got food that they forage. They've got food that we feed them. They've got shelter. They've got wallows. They're very content if they have everything that they need. Right. If they have that animalness of the animal, they have everything that they need. So it's really starting to understand all of that and then working all of that into your system. Yes, because when everyone says pigs break out, they're super intelligent. You know, they, they can figure out a way to get out. It's because they're bored. I, I think it's so. because they haven't got what they need in their surroundings. So they're going to, to go off and try and find it. I think, you know, in my days as a veterinary behaviorist, people had the, often the most trouble with border collies because they were bored out of their skulls. Yeah. You've got this breed that's designed to spend its day doing quite complex dog things. Yeah. And then you leave it in a flat for eight hours a day and, and don't really want to engage yeah. with it in the evening because you want to watch television and you wonder why it's stripping the wallpaper because it's got nothing else to do. Yeah. And pigs are easily as intelligent. Years ago, when I was a baby vet, I saved a pig called Rasher because he had erysipelas and I recognised it and gave him penicillin, actually. And this pig had been trained to be a sheep pig. In long before Babe and all the films, someone had bet them a crate of scotch that they couldn't train their pig to herd sheep and they went okay and the only problem was that the sheep would look at it going that definitely isn't a dog and and not moving and the pig would be going no no you need to move you need to move and the sheep would be going oh, okay eventually they would move off um but, but you know with that slightly puzzled look of the, this isn't right this shouldn't be happening yeah. but he it, Russia was easily as bright as a border collie yeah. and then we you know exactly keep them in in small squares it's, it's, horrendous. it's horrendous. I'm really, really impressed that you're able to to look at the animalness of the animal because then you can look at the peopleness of the people and the landness of the land and everything begins to work, as you say, as a family, as a team, as everything moving together. And so with all of that, again, in the book, and I'm really interested to bring this out, is you eat some of your family, effectively. <laughs> you know, it feels, you know, this is, there's a really interesting book called The Politics of Protein. I'm going to talk to the author of that in a few months' time. And I would like to explore the extent to which for you eating plants and animals is eating part of the family both ways and that we eat to live and how you have found the spiritual embracing of that. Yeah, no, gr great, great topic to bring up. Um, Manda, and I think I think it's a huge one. Um, and I think whenever you were sort of talking through it, there, I think one of the things that we're not so good about talking about or accepting or being okay with is death uh, in the world that we live in, and seeing death as a bad thing rather than as a cyclical thing. And, and I'm not saying that death is good. I'm just saying it's a cyclical thing. And I think that, um, you know, we are born of the earth and we will return to the earth. Those are the two certainties in life that all of us face. So there's that element. So there's an element of, of you know, what, what, what does death mean? Whenever it comes to uh, our animals, so we raise rare breed pigs and we raise highland beef. So we're, we're, you know, we can kill anything between eight to 10, eight to 12 pigs in a year and usually kind of two highland cattle, roughly. And then and some chickens. Uh, chickens just for ourselves, yeah. So we 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 sell we 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 dispatch actually chickens ourselves here on the croft. The pork, the pigs, and the beef, the cattle have to go 
to a registered abattoir right. if it's going legally. legally yeah. Right. So we work with an abattoir um, about an hour away from here. So we, we we load the animals ourselves, we bring them ourselves, we walk them in, and then we know from that point it's going to be over pretty quickly. The, with the pork in particular, what then happens is because we have the micro butchery, that then the animals come back to us. We then process them and then we then deliver them to our customers. So it's really all about kind of closing that loop as best that we can and, and really celebrating the produce. So, you know, by us doing it ourselves, we know that we can make sure it goes out in as pristine kind of condition as we can out of respect to the animal that is that is provided it for us. The first time we brought our pigs to the abattoir. I've never, you know, as, as a person, I've never really, you know, I've never really believed that, you know, eating meat is right or wrong. It's always just something that I've done. It's always something that I felt I've wanted to do and I felt I've needed. When we were working in, in certainly in the borders of Scotland, we really started to question um, where we were getting our meat from. So we started to basically only eat meat that was you know, wild venison shot on the hill. When we transitioned into farming, we made the decision that if we were going to eat meat, either we were going to kill it ourselves or we were going to follow a process whereby we could be as engaged or as involved with it as we could. Now, as I've explained to you, in the abattoir process, we can't get around that. But, you know, on my phone here, I have the number of the head slaughterman. You know, he, I can contact him directly. We've really went, we've really made an effort to build a connection with the abattoir and if I'm honest with you, I would say he is somebody that I trust. So I feel I can trust him. So that's helped kind of sort of the sting of what it is that we then, you know, have to put our animals through. I've also trained as a deer stalker. So I have a rifle. I can go out and shoot venison. I don't enjoy it. I don't do it for sport. I get no fun out of it. But I understand the context of why I'm doing it. It's to allow regeneration of trees. And it's a quick shot done. We then butcher Gralach, eat the meat or sell the meat, OK? Yeah. Through that whole process of either bringing an animal to its death or literally taking death, you know, taking life, uh, from an animal has been a journey that again I think with a lot of things we're, we're still on whenever the animals are here we take so much enjoyment from them you know I think some people come here and you know you get in you know you're out on a tour and you're in with the pigs and you're scratching their noses and they are loving it I am loving it and the people are loving it why not? You know, we, okay, we all know what's going to happen, but why not enjoy them when we're here? So we really do, you know, Sandra in particular, you know, she's down with the pigs. They're having a great time. We do, we do what's called pig tipping, which is when you scratch their belly and then they go onto their side and then they <laughs> just lie there all day. You know, we, we engage with the cows as well. We, we, we love having them here. And then you know, they're on that journey with us. They're, they're, they're then, their element of the journey comes to an end. We make it as efficient, as respectful and as, as quickly as we can. You know, we're in many ways, the way that our animals are killed are much kinder than how they would be killed in nature, you know, which could be quite a long drawn out process. It, it's not justifying any of this. It's just comparing it. Mm -hmm. um, and then when the meat comes back, uh, as I kind of explained before about the butchery element, it's really about turning our produce into the absolute best it can be, either through added value, you know, incredible seasonings or herbs, uh, or it can even be charging the amount that is really reflective to the value of what it is that you're buying. You know, you look at our cows, they're eating, I don't know how many types and types of grasses, wildflowers, they're eating lichens, they're eating tree leaves, they're eating this incredible buffet of, of kind of natural vegetation. That's what makes the meat. Yes. That meat is then, you know, consumed into our body. I am so privileged to be able to eat that myself. And I want to make sure that our customers equally feel privileged so that when they pick up a Limbrek burger or a Limbrek steak or a Limbrek sausage, they're not just going that's just a burger, that's just a sausage. They're yeah. excited. You know, it's like going to the Ivy, you know, forget the Ivy, you know, have a Limbrek sausage because wow, that's incredible. So it's really about building all of those connections through. And what I really love about all of that is that whenever I, you know, whenever somebody buys a pack of meat and then I bring it to their door, you know, I can say to them, what do you want to know about this animal? I can tell you everything. They get a sheet with all the information anyway of the animal, but it's lovely to build that connection between the, the producer, the animal, the land, and then the person who's ultimately going to eat it. And what I, I believe, get health from that. Yes, yes, because we still need to do a lot of the science on this, but it seems that milk or meat from pasture-fed, exactly as you said, in a biodiverse area is different, is qualitatively different than industrially processed stuff 
that that is just horrendous at every level. And I am thinking that on a spiritual level, because we're we're not as intensely farming as you are, but we're making similar choices. I get to know the animals. I well, you can have the conversation that says death is coming, but we will do the very best we can. Like you, we our local abattoir is eight miles down the road. We are all in terror of when the 80-year-old guy who runs it decides he's going to stop. And and then we'll, we'll have to crowdfund and find people who want to keep it going because it only makes sense if you can do that short journey. Keep it clean. They're not in layerage overnight. When I was a vet student, you had to do two weeks in an abattoir. And it was, I very nearly failed at that point. I, I It was the most horrific experience. And for the people there, just being surrounded by that much raw existential terror all day every day is an utterly dehumanizing process and and I want no part of it and I walked in there being a meat eater and I walked out a vegetarian for the next 15 years because I, I am not having any part of that but this is different and I think one of the things that you approach in your book is that plants are living too we project stuff onto animals with eyelashes and we empathize with them and that's fine we need to we need to give them the best possible life they can have but not eating meat is still, we're still consuming things. And if we're consuming things for which large areas of rainforest have been cut down and it's all imported, my feeling is that it's doing as much damage. It's just that we don't conceive of the damage as much as if we're, we're eating industrial pork or beef, which, which we shouldn't be doing, I think is quite clear. How do you connect with the plants that you eat? Is there any kind of a spirit to spirit, the plantness of the plants that you're growing? Yeah, I mean, I, th- I think I think the crux of what you're you're saying in that, you know, there, there is no life without death, so that there is no food without death. And I think, you know, we can't simplify it into meat or no meat. It's so much bigger than that. So the plants, um, I like to think that, you know, we kind of water them with love every day. You know, we, 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 we in, in terms of the plants that we eat, uh, let's say, uh, so we have a really um, productive kitchen garden, um, productive by, you know, tapping into to, to nature. So we have a, a an area outside where we have five raised beds, um, where we grow a whole range of vegetables from, you know, kale. We grow kale really well up here in Scotland, <laughs> year round vegetable to, um, you know, onions, garlic, leeks, um, Brussels sprouts, cabbages, uh, uh, d- d- beetroots, you know, it's just an absolute abundance out there. And it's all done in a way where it's really kind of tapping into, I guess, what people would define as the principles of permaculture, but it's not turning over the soil. It's not applying any kind of na- artificial fertilizers. And it's really wanting just a really kind of rich, crumbly, worm packed soil. That's what we're going for, which is what nature provides naturally. So we try and kind of work with natural processes to, to, to produce our food that way. How long did it take you to go from pretty much unfarmed land to your your rich, crumbly, worm-packed soil that you're able to to grow in? Well, in terms of the kitchen garden, um, you know, we were really... It took probably about four to five years to really ramp up production, right. you know, to the point where I can now say to you that between the kitchen garden and our, our polytunnel, you know, we're growing about 95% of our, our year round veg in, in those two areas. We, we can grow melons in our polytunnel. That's incredible. We've grown some melons oh, this cool. year. Yeah, we grew some last year. Wow. Lovely, like sort of cantaloupe melons, a, a, bit, a bit bigger than a, yeah, a bit smaller than the ones that you would get in the shop, but absolutely delicious. So that's taken about four to five years. I would say in terms of the field, um, it's still a, really in a period of transition, uh, you know, so, but we're starting to see areas where there was no grass growth and just moss to areas where the grass is, you know, at least half the height of your shin and growing, you know, every year it's getting a little bit more. And that's directly, we can see that we can pinpoint that directly down to the impact of particularly our chickens who work around, who work through the fields and our cattle, the way that we graze our cattle and the way that we feed them in the winter time using different, using kind of wildflower rich hay as well. Right. So you have 100% pasture fed yes. cattle? Yeah. But your pigs, is it possible to do 100% pasture-fed pigs or do they have to have some kind of cereal input? I think some people are close 
to doing more or less interventionist feeding. Ours get uh, an organic feed, so they get organic pellets, so that will be grains that we buy in. Okay. Uh, and then in addition to that, they'll get uh, what they forage. Uh, so they'll be foraging everything from the different types of grasses to you know things like bog myrtle, rushes, uh, heather. Right. They also get at different times of the year, they'll get uh, kale plants, uh, they'll get turnips, anything that we're, we've rejected from the kitchen garden they'll get. And then they'll get things like apples. Right. So we'll get people donate us apples in the autumn. Uh, and then we also get... Um, maybe about once or twice a month, they'll get beer draft. So we have a brewery down in Granton. Ah, fantastic. Just a small microbrewery. And every now and again, he'll come up with five or six bags of draft. And that will maybe do them, you know, a week to 10 days of feed. So it's a real, right. again, like them, it's a real diverse mix. It's, it's you know, it's funny, out of, out of all the animals that probably get the biggest, the biggest criticism would be the cows, you know, methane, carbon, these sort of, sort of snapshots as to why they're bad. Yeah. Actually, I would say the ones that maybe kind of cause the most, or that, that, that need the most intervention in terms of buying in feed is the chickens and the, the pigs. Now, they both, they both deliver incredible impacts for the land, but uh, it will be interesting to see how, as things change in farming, how that is going to change as well. Um, and there's certainly more and more studies being done in the UK as a whole on alternative feeds for, uh, you know, more kind of legumes or, you know, peas that could be used to feed chickens and to feed cattle or so to feed pigs uh, as well. So, so we're not importing soya exactly. from Brazilian exactly. rainforests. Exactly, yes. yeah. So we're we're technically way over time. This is so exciting and so interesting. I just want so just in the last few closing minutes, where do you see yourselves going? And then as a slightly bigger picture, regenerative farming within Scotland, because we haven't really localized this in Scotland, but I would like to, just as a closing thing, where are you heading, do you think? That's what's different or what's evolving? And then do you have a snapshot of a bigger picture? So I would say in terms of, if I tackle the regenerative farming one first, I think in terms of regenerative farming in Scotland, you know, from what I can see is, is you know, a kind of a, a jog is now turning into a sprint. There are more and more people talking about it. There are more and more people interested in it. And I think there are more and more people awakening to it and awakening to it, not just from a, um, a kind of a productivity element, you know, organic farming, all these kinds of ways of farming are not less productive. They can be equally and if not more productive. And I think people are awakening to that. And I think another reason why people are awakening to it is because cost wise, it makes sense. You don't have to buy a lot of stuff. Yeah. You just work with what you've got and you work with the animals. So there's lots of different elements. I'd say also, you know, one of the biggest things about regenerative farming is it's not just about regenerative, regenerating the land. It's about regenerating our minds. Yes. And if you can start to now, you know, look at all of that in a way whereby you're buying in less artificial stuff, you're working more with what you've got, you're reconnecting better with what you have. And that is good for, for mind and body. So I think really, you know, we when we started back in 2016, nobody was talking about regenerative agriculture. You know, we, we, we kind of, you know, we'd read about other people around the world doing it, but nobody was talking about it. You fast forward six years, you know, we're way behind that. We're way behind the leading crew now. You know, we're still doing what we were doing before, you know, but some people are doing incredibly exciting things. So I think the future is really positive in that sense. In terms of what we're doing at Limbrek, so, you know, looking back at the last six years has been crazy busy really really busy a bit of a blind leading the blind but a lot of a kind of a heart leading the heart and a gut leading the gut in the future so I know what we're doing until about the end of October this year um from that point on we have no plans Manda this is the first year we've ever decided to not have a plan fantastic I really, I really want to explain why that is one it feels like we're at that place it feels like I don't want I don't want to have a plan. I actually I don't want to know what's happening next. Now that can sometimes be scary because you know, let's say the financial element, I don't know exactly where all of our income's going to come from next year. But I think what we've what we feel in our guts is that this is a time of of just rest and relaxation that we need to recover, but also that we want to use as an opportunity to open new doors. You know, it's kind of like we're opening our 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 kind of our souls to the universe and saying, what next? You know, we're kind of opening wow. our eyes and saying, where are you going to take us to next? And that might be, 
you know, another year of doing the same, two more years of doing the same. We feel very drawn, you know, we're very passionate about growing our own food. We're very passionate about producing what we can for people locally. And I think what we're really also finding is that we're really, we just so enjoy um, having Limbrek as a place for people to reconnect with the land. And we do that through our tours and courses or whatever. We feel like that delivers such massive benefits. So um, I think going forward, it could be all of the above. Um, we don't know what capacity that in. It could be another book. I don't know. Sandra's not within earshot, so I can say that. But, <laughs> but I just don't know. But I just, you know, whenever I think about it, I just keep thinking, but you know what? We have the space and education and knowledge to grow our own food. We have water still in the well. We have about three years worth of firewood in the shed. Um, we have a really cosy house uh, to shelter in. It's going to be okay. And we'll get the bills paid, you know. And and that's really, I think, where we're sort of opening ourselves up to. So it's it's over to you, universe. What's next? Yeah, that sounds so extraordinary. I am so in awe of that. I yeah, definitely. That's a wonderful place to close. Just as a final thing, if people do want to get in touch with you and do want to find you, how do they do that? So the website is uh, limbrecroft.co.uk. So it's L-Y-N-B-R-E-C-K Croft, all one word, .co.uk. And we, we are on sort of Facebook and, and Instagram as well at Limbrek Croft. So, but head to the website and if anybody wants to get in touch, there's a little contact form and people can uh, message us directly. Excellent. And I will put those links in the show notes for people. Thank you. So that's definitely us. Lynn and Sandra in absentia, thank you so much for taking your morning to come and talk to us. That was fantastic. Oh, thank you very much for your time. I'm really grateful that you wanted to have a chat with us today. Thank you, Manda. And that's it for another week. Enormous thanks to Lynn and to Sandra and to Lynn Bright Croft for the inspiration of this week's episode. It feels so good to be able to talk to someone who gets it on every level the spiritual connection with the land, the interconnection with the land, that sense of tribe and family that goes beyond the human world to the more than human world, and the inevitable interconnectedness of us and it. We can't all go and live on a croft in the highlands, but we can all really begin to give thought to how we connect from the land, how we come from it, and return to it our relationship with life and death in all its forms. And Lynn and Sandra have done that so beautifully in the book, and I feel very fluently in this podcast. So I hope it provides another layer of inspiration for all of us to think about what we're doing, why we're doing it, and how we're doing it, and begin to evolve our lives into something that is as deeply connected as we can make it, to what makes our own hearts sing, and to what gives us the life that we have. And given that life and death are always interconnected, and that our lives are always predicated on the death of something else, what it brings to me is a sense that I then have an absolute responsibility to do with this life the best that I can in every moment. Which brings us to the spiritual aspect of being fully mindful, being able to connect with the web of life and ask it, what do you want of me? And being able to find the joy in every moment, because it is the moment that I have consciously chosen. It is the moment that I am living. It's the moment that I am processing in the best way that I can the gifts of this life and sending the meanness of me out into the world. And it increasingly seems to me, I've said this on the most recent podcasts, that this beingness, what it is to be me, what it is to bring everything that I can bring to the world, finding that and being able to live with it is what conscious evolution is about, at least as I understand it at the moment. And it is what we need, all of us, to bring to the world. So with that in mind, please find what is the you-ness of you and bring it to the world in the best ways that you can in the coming weeks. And that's it for now. We will be back next week with another very different conversation. In the meantime, thanks to Kara C for the music at the Head and Foot 
and for the sound production, to Faith for the website and the tech, and for considering the potential of a move to Scotland, to Anne Thomas and Jill Coombs for the transcripts, and, as ever, to you for listening. If you know of anybody else who wants to be part of this dance between us and the land, between life and death, between where we are now and what we could become, then please do share this link. And that's it for now. See you next week. Thank you and goodbye.